Welcome to another edition of Who's Number One. I'm Trey Wingo. You know, when it comes to college football, it's hard to narrow any list, whether you're talking best Hail Marys, toughest players, greatest championships, or my personal favorite, most inspirational cheerleaders. But never one to shy away from a challenge, we are giving it the old college try. And that's to figure out who's number one in the 20 biggest upsets in college football history. 2020. Ohio State was expected to get ahead early and stay there. The 1971 Rose Bowl, Woody Hayes and the Buckeyes were thinking national title. 11-point underdog Stanford had other thoughts. Well, Ohio State only had one loss in three years. They were 31-1 going into that ball game. Believe me, they did not uh, suffer for uh, lack of players. And no one expected Stanford to win. They were the, the poor little Indians in those days. But Stanford had a quarterback who won the Heisman Trophy that year, and it was Jim Plunkett. 20. 20. Plunkett's first pass went for a touchdown, but was called back. Undaunted, the Cardinal persevered and trailed only 14-10 at the break. Ohio State had an option offense that just ran over everybody, with Rex Kern leading the way. And John Brockington and Leo Hayden to hand off to if he didn't keep the ball himself. They didn't throw the ball much. They were just the opposite of us, but uh, they could sure run the heck out of it. Even though Jim Plunkett won the Heisman Trophy, a lot of people probably didn't see him play till that Rose Bowl game. We felt in order to beat him, we'd have to get the ball, you know, in the seams, over their head, keep them off balance. I just remember them hanging around and not getting run out of the building. No one expected us to win except us. You know, I don't think there was, a, I don't recall there ever being a doubt in our minds that we couldn't win that football game. Ahead 17 to 13, Ohio State gambled on fourth down, but Stanford held. Then Plunkett threw a pair of scoring passes for the 27-17 upset. Jim Plunkett was a big winner. Jim Plunkett knew how to pull things off. That game made Jim the number one draft pick in the NFL. And it cost Woody Hayes and the Buckeyes a national championship. If we had played Ohio State 10 times, they probably would have won nine. But that particular day, we weren't to be denied. October 19th, 1985. Washington against Oregon State without a winning record in 14 seasons. This wasn't David versus Goliath. This was more like David versus Goliath if David had two broken legs and had the chicken pox. I mean, Oregon State was awful. 19. Oregon State does not have a great history in the Pac-10. They were a 37-point underdog. I mean, that is a big underdog. Washington coach Don James was 10-0 against OSU, but the Huskies were clinging to a six-point lead with 146 left in the fourth. Here's the snap, good snap. He rushed, he walked it! He walked it, it rolls to the end zone, it might roll out. It's up for grabs, the Beavers recover for a touchdown! The Beavers have scored in Seattle! The block punt touchdown and winning extra point gave the beleaguered Beavers the 21-20 win, but didn't transform them into winners. And it's over! It's celebration time for the Beavers who have beaten the Huskies in Seattle. Oregon State pulls the upset. Their fans are so excited they think we're going to turn the corner after this. They had 14 more losing seasons after that. This was a, a pathetic Oregon State program at that point, and um, it had no business winning that game. And that's really about all I have to say to that. November 17, 1962. Number one ranked Alabama defending national champion versus Georgia Tech, 5-2-1. It will go down as maybe the greatest win in Tech history, which is saying something, seeing how this is the team that once won a game 222 to nothing. Eight. Bear Bryant coaching Broadway Joe quarterback. The tide rolling on a 26-game unbeaten streak. Yet Georgia Tech took a 7-0 lead late in the fourth. Alabama then countered with a late touchdown of their own. They went for a two-point conversion and probable win, 
but Tech stopped him, barely. To this day, Alabama would tell you they made it, but what do you expect? They get the onside kick, and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be a great comeback for Bama. It had to happen. You know, Bear Bryant and everything, but Tech made this tremendous defensive stand. Georgia Tech 7, Alabama 6. Brutal loss. Probably cost Alabama the national championship. They're still talking about that one at Georgia Tech because you just didn't beat Bear Bryant back then. Losing 7-6, it's still stuck right here. It's still stuck right here. Stanford was a pretty good team, 7-2 coming in, and California was awful. They were so awful that they had realized they have to get rid of the coach. And the coach was Joe Cap, and this was his last game. 17. November 22nd, 1986. Cal 1-9, Stanford 7-2. Stanford was headed to its first bowl game in eight years. Cal, an 18-point underdog, was headed to oblivion and Joe Cap was headed toward the exit. Joe Cap was one of those ferocious quarterbacks when he played for the for California in the 50s. Never gave up, no matter what the score was. Cap left behind a five-season record of 20-34-1, but he did beat Stanford three times. California found a way to beat Stanford. 17-11, Joe Cap went out a winner. Small consolation for losing his job, but it was a consolation to beat Stanford because, believe me, Stanford and California get along like two strange buzzsaws. You know, Notre Dame, you won, win one for the Gipper. I guess they won one for the Capper that day. 16, 16, 16. 1966 Rose Bowl, number one Michigan State, number five UCLA. 1966 Michigan State team were national title contenders with Duffy Doherty at command. And Duffy had a carload of hammer throwers. I mean, he had some big guys. Six, six, Jim Murray, great columnist for the LA Times, said this game is not even fit to be played. These giants from East Lansing against these poor little California guys. Undefeated Michigan State had beaten UCLA in the season opener 13-3. But the 14-point underdog Bruins, smaller but swifter, seized a 14-0 halftime lead. They just seemed to keep Michigan State off balance all day long. We could never get the momentum in the game. And now they come to reality. The reality is UCLA is pretty good. The Spartans scored two touchdowns in the fourth, went for two points, and ended up short 14-12. And on the very last gasp of the ball game, big old Bob is about to stuff it into the end zone. And Bobby Stiles got a hold of him and held him just short of the goal line. It's over. What happened? Where did this all go wrong? 15. 15. 15. 15. 15. The 2003 Big 12 Championship game. Unbeaten OU was a 12 and a half point favorite over Kansas State. The question wasn't whether Oklahoma was going to be playing for the national title, it was whether this is one of the greatest teams ever assembled. Jason White wins the Heisman Trophy. The Sooners are a tremendous team. And Kansas State and their quarterback, L. Roberson, show up and they are ready to play. 15. The Sooners looked every bit of a 12-0 team, rushing to a quick 7-0 lead. But even though averaging 48 points a game, they would get no more. As bad as Oklahoma looked on offense, they almost looked worse on defense, which hadn't happened almost all year. At halftime, that game was over. K-State's L. Roberson threw four touchdown passes, and Darren Sproles piled up 235 yards on the ground. Oklahoma just, just couldn't contain L. Roberson or Darren Sproles, and that's pretty lethal if you can't stop the run or the pass. And the score gets further and further out of hand. And at the end, it's 35-7. It's a totally one-sided game. Those things happen. I mean, they didn't happen. Sports would be boring.
The story of Notre Dame begins with the story of the underdog. Here was this tiny little Catholic school from the Midwest coming out in 1913 with this revolutionary offense, upset mighty army. They had 18 players and 14 pairs of cleats. That's how good Notre Dame was back then. Army couldn't figure out the forward pass, a little used weapon until then. Irish quarterback Gus Dureus, all 145 pounds of him, completed 14 of 17 throws for 243 yards, including a 40-yard TD to someone named Newt Rockney. Passing had come into prominence, I think, about 1906, but nobody had ever really used it to such an extent as Jess Harper, and when he came east with that passing combination of Doray to Rockney, it opened a lot of eyes. Powerhouse Army paid Notre Dame 1000 thinking it a bargain price for a sure win against a Hick team from the Midwest. The two Irish stars foiled that plan 35 to 13. And that made them famous, Doray and Rockney. That also brought attention to the forward pass, and of course it's been used very much ever since. But that was the first time it had ever appeared in an important, an important game like they had Notre Dame and Army. Rat Brady put them over. <laughs> College football madness began in the Ivy League. That's where it began, all this crazy Saturday afternoons. October 25th, 1947. Columbia, a 13-point underdog against Army. 13. 13. At that point, Army had won 32 straight games. Nobody was going to beat Army back then. What everybody wanted was Army to be undefeated when it played Notre Dame. Army's unbeaten streak appeared safe with a 20 to seven lead in the fourth quarter. But Columbia coach Lou Little kept ordering the ball to Bill Swiecki, who was instrumental in all three Columbia touchdowns. His one-handed diving touchdown catch cut the deficit to 20 to 14. Bill Swiecki became an All-American based on this game. He was a heck of an end. Swiecki, a transfer from Holy Cross, made another diving catch, his eighth, at the Army Four to set up a two-yard touchdown run by Lou Cousero with 6.37 left. With the extra point, the Lions had a 21-20 lead. They made it hold up. I think the song goes, who owns New York, who owns New York, C-O-L-U-M-B-I-A. And that night, Columbia owned New York. Notre Dame hadn't won a national championship in 15 years, which was like 1,500 years to Notre Dame people. But they had it all that year. November 28, 1964. Era Parsegan's Notre Dame team was favored by a dozen over John McKay's USC squad. 12. Most people thought Notre Dame would win this game. They were a solid favorite to win. And they jumped off to a 17 to nothing lead. The Irish, 9-0 and in ranked number one, got that lead helped by Heisman winner John Hewitt's passing to All-American flanker Jack Snow. John McKay, USC coach. His halftime speech consisted of, <clears throat> gentlemen, says, if we don't score more than 17 points in the second half, you're going to lose. The Trojans took their coach at his irrefutable word scoring 20 points in the final 30 minutes. The winner of Craig Furtick to Rod Sherman TD hookup. All the great coaches have at least one game where they wake up in the middle of the night and start sweating. And for Eric Persegan, I, th I think if you ask, them, it's this game. That was a dramatic, very dramatic year. And because we came within one minute and about 20 seconds, of uh, having an undefeated season. 11, 11, 11. November 20th, 1993. Undefeated Notre Dame was a 14-point favorite over Boston College. Notre Dame, the week before, has just knocked off number one Florida State. And everybody is psyched because now it looks like the Irish have got clear sailing to the national championship game. Only no one tells Boston College. 11, 11. Notre Dame was now number one in the country. 
figure Boston College would come into town, maybe put up a little battle. Boston College practically perfect, surging to a 38-17 lead in the fourth quarter behind Glenn Foley's four touchdown throws. Nothing goes wrong for BC today. This is amazing. And all at once, Notre Dame started driving. Lead action. Inside the 10. Touchdown, Notre Dame. Lou Holtz, 38-23 did something very smart. He went for two points. He's going to throw back to McDougal, and they get the two points. With 109 left, Notre Dame myth and magic conspired for a 39-38 lead. But Foley rallied the Eagles to the Irish 24 and turned it over to kicker David Gordon, a walk-on transfer from Vermont. The left-footed kicker, David Gordon, 41-yard attempt to win the game and end the Irish National Championship hopes. The happiest and the saddest day was in 1993. Come back to take the lead and only to lose at a heartbreaking. Goodbye National Championship, and you saw about 85,000 people walk out with a sour look on their face. When a game costs you the national title, that way, you never forget it. Welcome back to Who's Number One, an ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 biggest upsets in college football history. Look, just missing the cut is UTEP, which was mired in its 15th straight losing season in 1985. 15th straight! When as a five-touchdown underdog, they took out BYU. And twice a number two team was a touchdown underdog when it surprised the number one squad. Texas over USC at the 2006 Rose Bowl, and Penn State over Miami at the 1987 Fiesta Bowl. But that's just background knowledge for you. Now back to our countdown. Ten, ten, ten. 2003 Fiesta Bowl, number one Miami, number two Ohio State. Ohio State was obviously a good team, but Miami was NFL quality team. Some people might have thought Ohio State had a chance, but not most, not, not smart people anyway. I don't think people quite realized how physical a team Ohio State was. Ohio State's defensive line, right from the get-go, really set the tone. Ohio State blitzed a lot. They were able to hit Dorsey time and again. Miami came into the desert on a 34-game unbeaten streak. The Hurricanes were favored by 11 and a half, but Ohio State was not impressed taking a late lead. Miami needed a late field goal to force OT. Chris Harvey snaps. Petra holds. But we're going to overtime. Once Miami gets it into overtime, it looks like the Hurricanes, the more talented team, is going to win. Dorsey throws to the end zone. Touchdown. It is another fourth down for Ohio State. The ball goes into the end zone, and it is incomplete. Intended for Gamble. Now there is a penalty flag thrown. The game appeared to be over, and Miami had won. Ohio State had thrown an incompletion in the end zone on fourth down. When all of a sudden, you see this flag, and you're saying to yourself, oh, no. That was a terrible call. That's one of the all-time chokes by a referee. That call gave the Buckeyes a fresh set of downs, which they used to send the game into double overtime and then win with a goal line stand, 31-24. Darcy, under pressure, throws it. Incomplete. The Buckeyes win. It has to stand as not just one of the great, great upsets, but one of the great college football games ever. Nebraska here has been hit in the mouth, ladies and gentlemen, and let's see how they react. In the inaugural 1996 Big 12 championship game, Nebraska was a 19-point favorite over Texas. Nine, nine. Evans tripped up, slips free, first down, gone. Touchdown, Nebraska. 
football. Nebraska's won two straight national championships in 94 and 95. Nebraska is 9-1. and one. They are in line for the national championship game against Florida State, except the Big 12 has decided to institute a championship game. Tom Osborne, when they went to that conference title games, Tom Osborne said, hey, this game someday might cost the team a shot at the national title. Osborne's words would prove prophetic. Nebraska trailed by four late, and Texas faced fourth and short in its own territory. Against all logic, Coach John Makovic disdained the punt. Nebraska played tight, Texas played loose, and then on that ultimate fourth and one play. Fourth and inches. On a roll! Gonna throw it! Got it wide open, baby! Derek Lewis in a foot race! And Jamel Williams has got him at the 10 yard line! What a call by Makovic! Texas was rewarded for its boldness, scoring the clinching touchdown on the next play and scuttling Nebraska's hopes for its third straight national title, 37-27. John Makovic, he was not beloved at Texas. He would never really fit in. He was seen as sort of the, the wine-sipping coach. But boy, he endeared himself forever. Eight, 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 eight. November 22, 1969, The Big House. Unbeaten Ohio State was a 17-point favorite over Michigan. 1969 was the 100th year of college football, and many people were saying that the 1969 Ohio State team was the greatest college football team ever assembled. I think it probably was. If we win this Michigan game, then I'll have to say it's the greatest season of my life, yes. Michigan was hungrier, they were more prepared. Touchdown for Michigan! They executed better, and they just came loaded for bear against Ohio State. First and ten for Ohio State. Turn is hit hard. I told our staff in our first meeting, we're not here to beat any other team in the Big Ten except Woody Hayes and Ohio State. Woody Hayes and his defending national champion Buckeyes were riding a 22-game unbeaten streak. But Michigan, under new coach Bo Schembechler, Woody's protege, was physically superior. The Wolverines intercepted Rex Kern six times in a 24-12 shot. All at once, you heard 100,000 people. 10, 9, 8. to be the upset of the century. Seven, 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 seven. November 28, 1942, Fenway Park. Number one Boston College against a 500 Holy Cross team. BC was 8-0. Oh. Holy Cross was just... Okay. BC was undefeated, allowing only 19 points all year, and was poised for its first national championship. But in the final game of the season, arch rival Holy Cross leaped to a 26 halftime lead and kept piling it on. The cover of the program had the Boston College player wearing jersey number 12 the Holy Cross player wearing the jersey number 55. And that was the score of the game. If the score ended up 20 to 12, it'd be an upset and we might not have it on this list, but 55-12, that's what makes it memorable. Six, six, six. On October 17, 1998, Temple, losers of 72 of its last 83 games against undefeated Vatek. Like most years, Temple was awful this season, and they were 35 and a half point underdogs in this game. Six. Virginia Tech had this 17 to nothing lead, but somehow Temple came back. 
Temple was 0-6 and, and given up 40 a game. Vatek was allowing only six. But when the Owls begin to rally from a sizable deficit, the Hokies seem to tighten up. Once the other team comes back, the team that should win the game presses too hard and makes too many mistakes because they're not trying to win the game. They're trying to win the game by 38 points. He's going to run out of room. He's out of bounds. The Owls win. The Owls win. Purple wins. A year after that 28-24 upset, Virginia Tech would play for the national championship. Temple would continue to struggle. It doesn't really make sense, even now, if you look at it. it. It really had to be a case of a team that just decided it was going to walk onto the field and the uniforms would win the game. Temple should have dropped the program after this game and gone out on top. Temple, baby, Temple! Five, five, five. For a football game to be called great, it has to have a bearing of the national title, and something has to happen in the last two minutes. The 1984 Orange Bowl, number one and unbeaten, Nebraska was favored by 11 and a half over number five, Miami. This was simply one of the most exciting bowl games ever played. The option, Turner Gale, a pitch back to Rozier and he's open. This is the year in which Nebraska's offense is so powerful that it's considered unstoppable. I remember reading a story in Sports Illustrated at the beginning of the year that some NFL coach who said, you know, at least this year we don't have to play Nebraska. Back to Rozier, and again, the power run, and look at Rozier rip it open. Well, they were a great team, but, you know, we, we just believed that so are we, and, and we didn't want to back down to them. Gosar takes a look. He throws to Dennison. Touchdown, Miami. With quarterback Turner Gill, receiver Irving Fryer, and running back Mike Rozier, the Heisman Trophy winner, Nebraska averaged 52 points in their 12 wins. But Miami slinging Bernie Kozar directed the Canes to a 31-17 lead in the fourth. Then Nebraska rallied to within six, and with 58 seconds left, faced fourth and eight. Making a gutsy call, Coach Tom Osborne refused to kick the extra point and instead played for the win, calling a two-point conversion pass to Jeff Smith. Ball bounced off of Jeff's shoulder pad, and that was it. We had a chance to win it at the end. We just didn't get it done. If we had kicked the extra point, uh, we would have won the national championship, but it's kind of like backing in. And, you know, everybody can second guess it after it happens, and if it was negative, you did the wrong thing. If he would have done it, if he would have went for two and he would have won, he would have been the hero. The steel line from Bill Raftery. He showed some onions. November 27th, 1926. Newt Rockney's undefeated Notre Dame juggernaut against Carnegie Tech. Carnegie who? Carnegie Tech. Most people today know it as Carnegie Mellon. Four, four. Rockney was so confident in his 8-0 Irish, who had allowed only one touchdown all season, he went to Chicago for the Army-Navy game. He gave instructions before the team left for Pittsburgh, but there were no substitute for the coach himself. Carnegie Tech, a 5-1 underdog, pulled off a 19-0 upset. Carnegie Tech beat Notre Dame rather easily, and uh, uh, Rockney blamed, of course, for not being there. This game was such an upset that the usually outspoken Newt Rockney was speechless after the game. I couldn't imagine that in this day and age, Charlie Weiss uh, saying, well, I'm not going to the Purdue game. I'm going to go scout Stanford next week or something. He was lucky. They didn't have talk shows in those days. October 29, 1921, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mighty Harvard was unbeaten in 25 games. With a total enrollment of 254, the Center College praying colonels weren't supposed to have, well, a prayer. Three. Harvard had great football teams in early part of college football, and they really had good teams up until after World War II. From 1910 through 1919, they won four national titles. In the third quarter, with a punt return and a piling on penalty, Center took over at the Harvard 33. Bo McMillan, Center's quarterback, told his team, block better than you know how and I'll take her home. On the very next snap, 
He did just that with a dazzling zigzag run, and the team from Danville, Kentucky had its upset 6-0. For a team from Kentucky to go and beat Harvard, there's no way to overstate just how monumental an upset that was and how significant a moment it was. It was kind of a, a signal that, look, you know, the sport is spreading. Two, 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 two. It's unusual to think of Notre Dame as an underdog, but in that era, in the 50s, there was no bigger dynasty than Bud Wilkinson's Oklahoma Sooners. November 16, 1957. Oklahoma on an NCAA record 47-game winning streak taking on Notre Dame, losers of its last two. Every game that Oklahoma would play, we would win. All we had to do was just show up. At least that was the way it was beginning to feel. The week before, we had we had beat Missouri to cinch the conference championship and a trip to the Orange Bowl, and uh, there wasn't a lot of real good motivation or, or practice the week of the Notre Dame game. Uh, I don't think we were real focused about it. The last team to beat Oklahoma? Notre Dame, first game of the 1953 season. The Irish won this one when coach Terry Brennan, rather than trying for a field goal on fourth and goal at the Sooners three with 3.50 left in a scoreless tie, went for the touchdown. Dick Lynch took a pitch out into the end zone, giving Notre Dame a 7-0 win that sparked a superstition. I was flying back on a DC-3 to Fayetteville, and I was reading the Sports Illustrated magazine, and on the cover, it said why Oklahoma was invincible, why they couldn't be beat. And the pilot announced that Notre Dame had just beaten Oklahoma 7 and up, and I sat there stunned, and I looked at the cover of the magazine, and that was the issue that really started Sports Illustrated jinx. From that point on, there was a sense that if you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated, it could be a bad thing. Well, Oklahoma came into the game with a 47-game winning streak, and that's a streak we're not going to see again, uh, maybe ever in college football. It was one of those times when, when we didn't get ready and, and we got zapped. Welcome back to Who's Number One and the 20 Biggest College Football Upsets in History. Here's what we've got so far. 1971 Rose Bowl, Stanford 27, Ohio State 17. 19. 1985, Oregon State 21, Washington 20. 18. 1962, Georgia Tech 7, Alabama 6. 17. 1986, Cal 17, Stanford 11. 1966 Rose Bowl, UCLA 14, Michigan State 12. 15. 2003 Big 12 title game, K-State 35, Oklahoma 7. 14. 1913, Notre Dame 35, Army 13. 13. 1947, Columbia 21, Army 20. 12. 1964, Southern Cal 20, Notre Dame 17. 11. 1993, Boston College 41, Notre Dame 39. 10. 2003 Fiesta Bowl, Ohio State 31, Miami 24. 9. 1996 Big 12 title game, Texas 37, Nebraska 27. 8. 1969, Michigan 24, Ohio State 12. 7. 1942, Holy Cross 55. Boston College, 12. Six. 1998, Temple, 28. Virginia Tech, 24. Five. 1984, Orange Bowl. Miami, 31. Nebraska, 30. Four. 1926, Carnegie Tech, 19. Notre Dame, zero. Three. 1921, Center College, six. Harvard, zero. Two. 1957, Notre Dame 7, Oklahoma 0. The upset of upsets. The one that could never happen, but did. Number 1. 1, 1, 1, 1. You have upsets in every sport, and there's really no explanation. If everything went according to form, we would all die of boredom. December 2nd, 1950. Army, one win away from a third straight undefeated season, 
was a 21-point favorite over 2-6 and six Navy. From 1944 through 1950, Army lost a total of three games. Navy was just absolutely not that good. Something about that opponent, it wasn't just any opponent, it was Navy. And anytime you match Army against Navy, they say these two teams just don't like each other. Well, <laughs> these two forces just don't like each other. This is more than just a game, it's the ultimate rivalry. Navy scored two touchdowns late in the first half, forced five Army turnovers, three of those inside the Navy 20, and dropped anchor on the cadet streak, 14 to two. 1950, they just didn't have the horses. Army had not lost a game since 47, and Navy wasn't a team that was seven and two or something, or seven and one. They were a team that lost many more games than they won. And yet, they pulled this upset, 14 to two. This, I consider the greatest upset in the history of college football. Navy 14, Army 2. Well, now that those underdogs have had their say, we bring in our own. Our second guessers, the Junkies. Four sports-crazy radio talk show hosts from D.C. and Baltimore. Fellas, what do you have? All right, guys, time to break down the best college football upsets of all time. Going back to 1950, and that's a long time ago, but Navy beats Army 14-2. Navy, 2-6 two and six coming in, into the game. Army looking for their third straight unbeaten season. They were 8-0 coming into this game. Army coughs up the ball five times, three times inside Navy's 20. And you know, any, we're from kind of outside of Annapolis. Anytime Navy beats Army, especially, you know, it could be the only win of the season, it's a huge win, especially when they're ranked number two in the country. If you say so, I mean, it happened I'm when I was you broke negative. That one down for us. I mean, right. <laughs> we were all negative 20 years old. Well, at the Army, time. they were 21 point favorites. I know Lurch would have put heavy cash on the cadets in that game. See, you know what? When you talk about greatest college football upsets, though, that's what I'm looking at. I'm right. looking at ridiculous lines. I don't see how Temple beating Virginia Tech isn't number one. That was a line of 35 and a half. Right. And game. I remember the game. Dude, Temple, you probably had money on it. <laughs> Temple was 0 and 5. Winless. They're awful. Virginia Tech was 5 and 0, and the line was almost 36 points. Well, Temple may win one game a year back then. Right. Okay, they maybe only win one now. How about Lee? Who knows? But 35 and a half point dogs, it's homecoming for Virginia right. Tech. Right. It's fat winner. Okay, you're thinking, oh, it's homecoming, everyone's jacked up. They go out and lose the game to Temple? Well, Virginia Tech was sense. giving up six points per game. Right. They'd given up 30 points on the season until Temple you know, came well, to town. I think, I think Beamer threw the game. <laughs> well, he might have. Temple was giving up 40 points a game. Right. And they were not only 0-5, they were 11-72 and leading up to that game well, they were since 1990. Their last winning season was in 1990. One that jumps out at me here is number five on the list. I have beef with Miami upsetting Nebraska 31-30 in the Orange Bowl. They were number five in the country. I think it's probably most known for Tom Osborne's decision. Right. He could have won the national championship by kicking an extra point. Well, he would have backed into it. Would he have to share it? Or would he be all by He would have finished in a tie. Yeah. I mean, he, he, you know what? Showed the stones. He went for the win. Right. And he lost the game. Yeah. I actually yeah. respect him for it. If you want a real upset, you go to number three on the list. 1921, Center College. Okay, can any of you name where, that's, where that is? I'm a big uh, fan of I'm going to say it's in the center of Georgia. How about it's in the center of Kentucky, and they had an enrollment of 254 students, and they beat Harvard, who had won 25 straight games in front of 43,000 people at Cambridge. That is a huge upset. Right, you know, that's not as big. I'm sorry, it just isn't. It's not as big as when your boys, the Terps, beat Miami, down 31 nothing at halftime. The Miami players at, at halftime as they entered the tunnel are laughing at the Terps. Okay, and then Frank Reich leads the troops. They come back, they win 42-40. Uh, I remember Willie Joyner, who was a running back, had some huge plays in that game. And that was just an unbelievable comeback, especially here in the Washington area, because no one thought that the Terps could beat Miami, and they were, you know, they were a juggernaut back then. Terps, of course, an ACC team. I think a seminal moment in the ACC is when Virginia knocks off Florida State. That doesn't make this list. Florida State looked unstoppable. In the ACC, nobody thought any team could even come close, Virginia being the first team to break through. I think that was huge. Should be on the well, list. The Barber brothers were on that team, weren't they? Tiki and Ronde? I believe they were, and I believe, yes, they were. And then that was the play where Wark Dunn had, what, fourth and two. Stopped him short. Stopped him at the goal line. And right. I think Al Groh's son, Mike Groh, was the quarterback for Virginia. Right. 
At number 11 on the list, BC beating the Irish in 1993. The Irish had just beaten Florida State the week before in a huge 1-2 matchup. They, they figured they'd have a breather with Boston College coming to town. They kicked the last second field goal. Irish go home limping. No national title for them. That's what they're looking for. Yeah, but for. how's that a breather? I mean, Boston College is ranked in the top 15 that right. year. I mean, you can't sleep on Boston College, especially right. when they're ranked. But at home, you figure the Irish probably win that game yeah. eight times out and of ten. And again, I had another rooting interest in that. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> and they are surprise. Notre Dame. When, when don't you? You know, certain <laughs> teams, when you knock them off, it's a complete surprise. Even when sometimes it's a one versus a two situation. I think recently, when you had Texas and Vince Young knock off USC, mm -hmm. USC had won two national championships. They hadn't been losing at all. They looked invincible. So now you like when two beats a one. If, if it's recent, <laughs> right. If it happened in the last three or four that's, years, you'll put it on the list. That's one of the greatest individual performances you'll ever see in college football with Vince Young. He single-handedly beat them. Right. Well, I mean, he, he really did. And he got he him, had over 500 total yards. Got him drafted number three overall, even though he may have some of the worst mechanics of any quarterback. Yeah, it's certainly upped his stock, even though he throws the ball from down here. But, I mean, nobody was betting on Texas in that game right. outside of people in Texas or people who were playing the lines. Straight up, nobody was betting Texas. No, absolutely not. I believe Matthew McConaughey did. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's our look at the best college football upsets of all time. Now that the second guessers have had their say, it's time to see how you, the fan, voted on Sports Nation on ESPN.com for the greatest football upsets of all time. Number five, 1921, Center College six, Harvard nothing. Number four, 1993, Boston College 41, Notre Dame 39. Number three, 1998, Temple 28, Virginia Tech 24. Number two, 2003 Fiesta Bowl, Ohio State 31, Miami 24. Number one, Big 12 title game, Kansas State 35, Oklahoma 7. So that's it for this edition of Who's Number One? I'm Trey Wingo, and thanks for joining us for ESPN Classics ranking of the 20 biggest college football upsets in history. We will be back to continue our countdown of the teams, the athletes, and the events that have shaped our world of sports. Until then, let the debating begin.